Hi everyone. This is Miriam Naime from Newcastle University and the Alan Turing Institute. Welcome to the Smart Charging webinar. The webinar is an activity of Supergen Energy Networks, which is led by Newcastle University and the Vehicle Grid Integration Group based at the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, the Alan Turing Institute is the National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. And one of the objectives of the Institute is to apply data science to help solve real world challenges, such as integrating electric vehicles into power systems. On this webinar, uh, we had several talks discussing uh, charging infrastructure rollouts. For example, recently we had talks from California and Denmark and we learned uh, how much infrastructure they would need to meet uh, electric vehicle uh, um, penetration targets, where this infrastructure would go, uh, what is the type. Uh, one interesting thing was the EV Pro tool mentioned by Noel Krisomoto from CEC in our last webinar. We also have um, a group of talks on communication protocols for um, uh, electric vehicles. And these communication protocols emphasize the openness, the standardization, so that we ensure inter interoperability. So we had talks on OCPP, we had talks on um, OpenADR, we also had talks on ISO 15.11.8, uh, and uh, all the slides are available online, and also uh, you can watch the videos on YouTube. Uh, the upcoming event is going to be in February and we're going is going to focus on another uh, communication protocol. Uh, it's a generic one. It's not specific on electric vehicles, but uh, it could be used with electric vehicles and it's called IEEE 2030.5. Today's talk is by Paul Bertrand. Uh, Paul is the convener for uh, uh, in both in GWJ1 and ISO 15.11.8 and uh, Joint Working Group 11 in IEC 63110. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass uh, the presentation to Paul because I know he uh, prepared for us a really good presentation. So Paul, over to you. Thank you, Miriam. So I will share my screen. Yes, normally you should be able to see it. Yes, we see it, Paul. Thank you, Miriam. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending these keynotes on uh, IEC 63110. As Miriam said, I am Paul Bertram, the convener for Joint Working Group 1 and Joint Working Group 11, IEC 63110. And I, I am the convener on behalf of EDF, which I represent in those committees. But this presentation will not be made on behalf of EDF. I, am, I will be presenting on behalf of IEC as a convener of Joint Working Group 11 group. So this is a very basic summary of my presentation. I will first give a perspective of the e-mobility standards landscape. That's very useful to understand the different roles and who is acting. Then I will give a zoom on 63110 organization, member scope, communication architecture, requirements and transport technology, use cases, session, interconnection with other standards, and give a quick conclusion before uh, question and answer. So first, let me give you a perspective of what we have in the immobility e standards landscape for the moment. So first, what is really in stake for uh, immobility in the future? What we have today in 2020, it's an emerging new mobility environment. We today have around 5 millions of EVs circulating in the world, more or less millions of public charging uh, stations deployed today. With those millions of systems, the industry is fast learning and coping with those mobility needs in the, more cities every day. And um, large utilities are uh, engaged in a massive investment to support increasing demand of electricity due to this mobility booming. And I have to say that most of the stakeholders has smart charging and V2G in their agenda. 
But if we kind of project in 20 years, which is one of the points many actors are looking at, uh, and if you take the assumption that today, the number of EVs is almost doubling every 18 months, this rate will not be always constant, evidently, but for, this is what we have now. It really, it is expected that hundreds of millions of publics and private charging stations will be deployed everywhere. And everywhere is in homes and building, in every streets, in parking lots, companies, airports, shopping malls, everywhere. And they will be with, attached with those millions of publics and private infrastructure for charging. There will be billions of successful, hopefully successful, charging session and transaction that will have to be ensured every day. Uh, most of this charging session will have to be securely connected to operator system via standardized protocol. And some, I don't know how many, no, there's no clear view on that, but some of them will be uh, connected in a way that they could allow V to G, vehicle to grid, vehicle to home, vehicle to building. So that means that we are close to a situation where we will have to deal with those hundreds of millions of charging stations deployed in the world. And this is why the main objective of this keynote is to explain how and what is 6 c and how this standard will be able to manage those hundreds of millions of charging stations in the world that will be transferring more or less uh, 1,800 tera an hour of electricity per year into and from EV batteries. That's a real challenge, and that's the challenge we have to, to deal with in uh, 6 c 110 So, if we now come to uh, what does it mean in terms of energy landscape, uh, what is this target of handling millions of EV and how we can handle that? If we remind at the first early time, uh, it was the safety that was the first and the only requirement for charging EV. And that, in that time, we had a standard for that, that was IEC 61851. And those standard was not communicating with secondary actors and we were not talking of more than just putting enough energy into the battery and that was it with safety um, constraint, obviously. But now that we are adding communication technology, the next challenge is to ensure, in addition to this safety feature, interoperability, cybersecurity, Great integration and scalability. Uh, the scalability is one of the most constraining requirements based on the numbers we had seen before. And those criterion that the communication technology will give will be supported by a set of standards. Some exist today and some are in a, in a way they are in, 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 in the building of their basis and foundations. So this is the case for 60C110 and 60C119. ISO 1508 is now on the road to be deployed. We have two versions already. And 61850 is a, a, a standard that is um, ensuring grid integration of all the assets from the grid industry. And it will have to be covered by all the immobility e technology and communications. So, when we started discussion in IEC 63110, the first question was how to start to build such a complex protocol uh, starting from not nothing because a lot of experts has already deployed something. Uh, but how to start, that was really one of the good questions we had. And fortunately, the IEC provided a methodology for defining such a protocol that will ensure cybersecurity, interoperability, grid integration, and scalability. And uh, this methodology starts with a role model and use cases. And on the basis of this methodology, there is what is named the SGAM, the Smart Grid Architecture Model. And um, I will not get into much detail in, in this model. You can have the, you have the link here where you can look. But the basic idea is to separate 
all the roles and interoperability dimension into, into domains and zone and to describe what are the relation between the different layers through interfaces among these domains and zone. So this is basically the methodology we have applied for those. And everything starts with a role model and use cases. So why a, a role model is so important at starting such a, a protocol design? Basically, a role model is a conceptual representation of interaction between all the actors considering their role in a specific market, in our case, the immobility market. So describe who are the actors that are willing to act in this market. So that's the first place where a role model is important. But the role model connects those actors through interface and protocol. That is where the communication protocol will allow interaction connecting those roles through interfaces. But that is not enough because how to connect those actors and how to decide how they will interact. This is the role of the use cases, where this communication standard through the use cases will describe the way the exchange of information is captured. Once we have that, you can ensure that you have developed a standard that will ensure enough interoperability between all the actors through the different role in their market. So the first thing we have to to, to cope with and to design was the role model and what are the interfaces. So if we come a little bit past what was existing before 2015, that was, let's say, kind of a time where uh, they were the key off of the immobility. It exists before, but at that time, they, we were already talking of mobility environment, communication, and all those sort of things. So what exists in that time? We had the EV user, uh, uh, EV and e EVSE. So then the user just plugged to the EVSE. This was basically a control charging with no really interoperable systems. The plugs were not totally defined and unified. And the safety was there because it was ensured by the 61851 standard. And ba barely there were no communication with secondary actors. But then we realized that we were in need of more actors because the environment was entering more and more EVSC deployed and we feel the need for having more structured environment. So as we need more actors, basically we define new system. And one of the main system that were defined at that time and until last year was what we call the CSMS, which is the charging service management system which is a service of an operator, which is the charging station operator. And this system is in charge of managing the behavior and the maintenance of the EVSEs. We introduce some new element here, uh, the private network EMS, which is the energy management system. And for some reason that I will detail later on, we introduce an edge system here, which is called the local CSMS. Then, Around this operator having this system to manage the EVSE, we, 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 we thought that, and the market thought that immobility service provider that are in link with the EV user was not totally connected to the EVSE because they do not operate EVSE. So there is a link, link that were established between immobility clearinghouse system and immobility service provider so that a user could connect in every charging station whatever immobility service provider he has a contract with and if it's different from the contract offered by the CSO. And, and that, that was it. Basically, this is what we have now and we are now in the premise of offering a little bit more because what is charging station all about is that transferring energy from the grid to the battery of the EV. And then come the energy system. So if we try to connect this energy system to the mobility system and at the end to the private network where 
the user has his EV and connected to an EV receipt, could be public or private, then we have to define much more interfaces and much more communication through a lot of different actors. And this is a simplified role model of the energy market. Basically, we have identified a DSO that is an important actor because it has relation with all the EMS. And we have identified a flexibility operator system that connects the flexibility market of the energy to the mobility system. So all these arrows there are describing communication. And the role of the standard is to describe precisely the interface between all those actors and the communication. And this is where the standard come. So we have a famous ISO 1518, which is there, the red arrow connecting the EV to the EVSE. And then we have 623110, which is the standard that connects the central CSMS, which is the cloud system operated by the charging station operator, to the CSMS and the local CSMS. We see that there are relation between the, the energy management system and the central CSMS. The other one is IEC 623110, which takes care of the roaming point to ensure that, again, the EV user using his mobility provider system can use the charging infrastructure of a particular uh, CSO. The orange arrow there is still waiting for standardization. That's a very important one. There are existing standards, but we need in IEC to define something that would use maybe the existing one and connecting the energy market to the mobility system. And this is something that is pending now, and some of actors are now working on that to propose a new work item on that. So once this will be standardized, we will have a full eco-environment providing service to users, service to mobility system actors, and connected all those actors to the grid. So this is a, a standard landscape with a, a simplified version. If we connect this particularly and horizontally to the SCAM, and I would not enter too much in detail here, but we see the different section we have in the SCAM model. We see that here. I think it's a scam. Sorry? So this is uh, the, the, the SCAM model that we are using in 6C110, where you can see that there is different domain and, and, and field here. And uh, the mobility, immobility components of the 6C110 is just here at the boundary of what is called DER, distributed energy resources, where you could find stationary batteries, solar panel and windmills. And we will see that if we go into the information layer projection in this GAM model, we will find that 63110 is there in the middle of the CSMS and the charging station controller. And we see all the branches we have defined with ISO 1508 here, the DER element here, and we see that a charging station connected to an EV is considered as a DER. And we see a parallel branch here that is defined and by the energy actors, which deals with DER unit controller, DER management system. And the parallel we have here between the units, the EVSE, the controller, the DER unit controller, and the DER management system make this parallel very useful because if we use similar approach for designing protocol, we may have a full interoperability between the two worlds, the immobility world and the energy world. So this is one of our targets I will explain a little bit later. So now we have actors. We have to connect those actors between use cases and role model. So basically, uh, maybe all, most of you know that, but it's always good to rephrase what looks to be evident. Uh, communication standards uh, basically describe protocol and the way to exchange information between role in a market model. So we have the model, we have the roles. Now we need to define how we can exchange data between those roles. And basically, 
we have to ensure interoperability between those roles. So the communication describes what has to be exchanged, that's the information, and how the, pro that's the protocol, uh, it is transferred from one interface to another one. The what is exactly describing the business use case we will have in our standard. And the how is describing how the what design in the business use case will be transmitted in the message transported by the protocol. All the modern communication standards like IEC 62C110 have normally one specific document for business use case and another one for message and protocol specification. This is the case for 1511A, this is the case for 60C119, this is the case for most of the 61851 and 550 standards, and that will be the procedure we will apply. So this comes to the next question. We have actors, we have roles, we have, uh, we know that we have to rely and re relate, have relation between those actors and roles be among business use case. So we need an organization in IT 63110 to cover those, mm, those items. So basically how it is organized and what is 63110? 6110 is a standard developed by John Working Group 11 of the IEC Technical Committee 69. It was initiated by France, Germany, and Italy uh, in November 2017. So it's a joint working group between two groups. One is TC69, who is in charge of electrical road vehicle and electrical industrial trucks. And the other is TC57, who is in charge of power system management and associated information exchange. The one is for the energy side and the other, TC69, is for the mobility side. So expertise is diverse and shared between the two groups. So the group has today, right now, I checked yesterday, <laughs> 82 experts from 21st nations. And this is one, of, this is the bigger active group in TC69. Some countries are very active and they have a lot of delegates. Some have less delegates, but that doesn't mean they are not active. So the scope of this standard and the scope is something very um, important in a standard. And every day in our meeting, we have to check that if we are designing something, we always stay in our scope. It's not good to step in other fits on other TCs because then we mix our message and uh, this won't work. So our scope is to address the requirement and information exchange for the establishment of an electromobility ecosystem. And therefore we will have to cover communication between different actors and the data flow with the electrical power system. So that's very important that we have to build a standard that will ensure this establishment of a safe and secure electromobility ecosystem. That's something very important. And it, 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 it is not a simple protocol between a, a, a device and a super device. It's a protocol that we have to ensure that the ecosystem for mobility and energy works properly when it uses this standard. So to do that, it will have to cover a lot of features. I have extracted the, the, the most important. So we have to manage the energy transfer. Uh, one of the energy transfer is charging station. This is what the user expects. The, the standard has to work. And every time a user connect the plug, the whole system has to work. And this is one of our main objective is to make the thing work. He also has to manage the reporting, including information exchange related to the required energy, the grid usage, contractual data, metering data, all the data necessary to make sure that the energy has been transferred, measured, counted, and invoiced. Of course, to do that, we have asset management. We, the control, the monitoring, the maintenance, the provisioning, the firmware update and installation, configuration profiling of the whole system, including down to the EV supply equipment itself, not only for the whole charging station. Of course, when the user gets to the point to start a charge, you need to authenticate, to be authorized, and to show that the payment can be possible. 
for charging and discharging section. And this will include the roaming, the pricing and the metering information that will have to be transferred to um, other groups like 63119 for the roaming protocol. Other services will have to be uh, implemented like reservation, for example, which is very important um, feature for a user acceptance of, this, of the standard. So what is the structure of the standard? It's very basic and classical now. We have three parts, one for the use case and architecture, the second for the protocol specification and requirements, and the third one for the conformant test. Uh, currently, the part one is, is in a stage close to CDV, so committee draft for vote, which is uh, an intermediate draft between the uh, 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 published standard and a committee uh, document. The part two has studied it works and it started to define the protocol. Uh, obviously the part three for conformant tests need to have more progress done on part two, so it didn't start yet. The standard is organized uh, through a typical organization, so we have two co-convener, myself from EDF, I already stated that, and Stefan Voigt from Energy in Germany. Um, there is project team organized. I am responsible for the use case and general requirement, PD1. Uh, the PD2 is organized with message sequence timing protocol, and that's Peter Thompson from ChargePoint and Mike Kira from ABB. And the conformant test not yet started will have its own PD3 leader. There has been some task forces organized. I will not enter into too much detail, but you need to know that we have a cybersecurity task force that produce a risk assessment report that will be included in the use case and will we have specific requirements for to ensure the cybersecurity. Ob object model and transport technology are um, have been working and I will uh, give you more detail later on on that. What about the timeline? Uh, that's a critical question because the industry is waiting for the standard and we know that the longer it takes, the longer industry will uh, be frustrated. Um, today, in the, we are basically here starting 2020. Um, we are, as, as we said, in a CDV basic elaboration phase for the part one. The part two has just started. We had a preliminary task for working in the encoding technology and now we have in a in an early stage of a working draft document hopefully we will have a first document to be distributed to the national committee before the end of this year that's one of the targets and we could have a cdv mid 2021 or before the end of 2021 the F this, which is a document that can be distributed to industry and the publication at least. The F this is something that we, we, we would like to be published early in 2021, in a year from now for the part one. And the corresponding F this document, which is a draft international that can be by by industry. Um, for the part two, uh, Okay, this is more difficult to say, but our objective is to have something in, in basically two years, two years and a half. Obviously the conformance test document will start somehow uh, in a year, just to make sure that we have enough information in the CD one of the part two. Uh, just for information, for those who want to attend, uh, there is a, a meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting in Delft in, uh, in February, in three weeks. And we have regular, regular meeting in every country because we have to switch from Europe, America, and Asia every three or four months. So communication architecture. This is the main, let's say, work we have to do to uh, design our, our standard. So as I said, the, the, the architecture depends on the roles and the actors. So uh, we have energy actors, we have immobility actors, and we have um, uh, electrical vehicle and EV user actors that are also are immobility actors. So those are the secondary actors. The primary actors, which is the, the actors exchanging message into the scope of 63110, basically is the charging station controller here, 
And the CSMS, which is the charging station management system, that is the system of the charging station operator. So our scope is between all those two actors. But it's important to understand that message between those two actors are strongly influenced by secondary actors. Basically, the EV and the user will have a strong impact in the charging session or in the identification here. Secondary actors from the grid will also have a lot of um, action and interference during the data exchanges. Um, so what is a possible communication architecture between those primary and secondary actors? Let's try to figure that and see what would work and what would not work. So basically, the standard system for a charging station is to have a group of EVACs, could be one, could be more, could be 10, could be 20, depending on the, the, the size of the charging station. Usually this charging station is located behind a smart grid connection point, which is the connection where the grid um, connects to the building, the parking lot and the area. So the charging station controller manage all the EVACs via some dedicated communication link, which is out of our scope. This is a secondary actor for us. So our primary goal is to connect the charging station to the charging station management system, which is a cloud a system operated by the CSO. And um, this orange arrow is the 6 to 6 110 interface here, and this is the 6 to c 110 link. So the charging station controller has an interface that is able to connect to the charging station management system through IEC 6 to c 110 That is fine. That will work. And then we have secondary actors that are able to connect because they know him, the charging station operator. But, um, they, and they try to influence what happens here. The point is that this is not realistic schematic because there may be other loads here, there may be a meter, there may be some devices, there might be systems where the DSO and flexibility operator or energy provider could interact with. So they are missing part here and we need to add them to understand the whole ecosystem that may influence the message going through this protocol. So, I tried to figure out here what could be the others missing parts and other nodes. If you have, if you are in a building, there might be air conditioning, there might be lighting, there might be production whatsoever, and there might be also production of energy and storage. If you may have also solar panel whatsoever and storage, this is now more and more easy to find. So all of those elements, including the mobility infrastructure are usually uh, optimized by a customer energy management system. It's called here a SEM. The SEM is in charge to um, find the optimization of all the energy flowing from the grid and produced locally and consumed, including the energy for the charging session. The point is that the SEM has no idea of the contract, the user coming here to charge, and then cannot influence directly them because it just doesn't know how to speak with. And he has no idea who could be the charging station operator. And sometimes it doesn't have the way to connect directly here. So there is still in this architecture a missing link with the SEM and the communication stream between the charging station controller and the CSMS. So we have to solve that. And for that, IEC 63110 introduces what we call an edge element, which is the local CSMS. So the local CSMS is able to have relation with the CSC, the charging station controller, and to the CSO through the CSMS. We call now it the cloud CSMS, and we have it this local CSMS. So the local CSMS can exchange message with the cloud CSMS with the SEM and with the charging station controller. So now we have a loop here that can be established between all the communicating actors, either locally or from outside. The local CSMS is a very important piece of our standard because uh, 
you have three, basically three function. You can route seamlessly all incoming message between the charging station controller and the cloud CSMS. You can interface with the customer energy management system and route all the message to the cloud CSMS. And you can also take local decision if you have enough information for that based on contract and customers connected to the EDSC. Or if for any reason, the, the cloud connection with the CSMS is broken, then the local CSMS can still ensure that the customer will be able to charge. In that schema, other loads, the local production and storage can exchange energy both ways with the grid and with the charging station. So the charging station sometimes will be able to take energy for the grid or from the production or storage. Sometime, in other time, for other condition, the charging station globally will be able to inject energy either into the grid or into storage for permanent storage for other usage in the other time of the day. So this is the infrastructure we have chosen in 6110 because it's covered all our requirement to connect different actors, secondary actors, local actors to the grid and to the charging station. So let's give some example now of how this works. So let's take a, a very specific and very usual, just a single home with one wall box. This wall box has 62110 capability. So again, we have the same similar schematics. We have the secondary actors, we have the CSO. In that case, if we are talking of very basic small wall box for probably cost reason, there is only one box and there is no local CSMS in that case. So the CSMS does connect directly to the charging station through a link here that could be Wi-Fi, Ethernet, whatever it is. And it connects to the charging station controller that is embedded in the charging station. Usually those system may have an internal uh, SEM, an internal customer energy management system embedded in the same charging station in the same wall box that could connect to the meter and uh, for example, to, to, to be able to read a special incentive tariffs coming from the meter that could be peak hour tariff or other similar things. And this meter is connected to the DSO, basically that's uh, uh, some countries have this model where the DSO is in charge of the meter and connect this meter providing a special tariffs for peak hours. So this is a very simple, um, architecture that works with our 60C110 architecture This it has been chosen for. If we take the two, and that will be the case in many years where every most of the home may have two electrical vehicles, so they may need two wall boxes. So in that case, we see where the local CSMS is important because the SEM, and this, this home could have loads, obviously, could have major and could have local production, solar panel. This is very, um, not a futuristic use case. It still happened more and more. And in the case you have two cars and local production, you need to balance in the home who, what is, where is flowing the energy out of the grid, from the grid into the local production to the EVs or into the local production to the grid. So all of this is managed by the customer energy management system and the local CSMS will uh, do load balancing between those two wall box, ensuring that based on mobility needs from the user, uh, the two cars will be charged, whatever the constraint has been given by the customer energy management system. This is one role where the local CSMS can take local action for um, load balancing between the two uh, systems. This is a more complex case that will happen as well. And that's an example of high power EVSC in a highway charging station. That's a good example where you have a large number of EVSC potentially with very high power. Some of them could reach 250 or even more kilowatts. So that's quite a big amount of power, more than megawatts that could be uh, consumed uh, all the time in, in this kind of charging station. Um, 
there is probably not other significant loads close by in the solar grid connection point compared to this megawatt, maybe some lighting, some process, a coffee machine or whatsoever, but this is totally negligible. So all the power is dedicated to charging and not sure for discharging, but at least charging. And um, in that case, the whole system being a controllable load is considered as a DER, distributed energy resource. And in some country, the DSO may have an interface here, uh, direct connected to the DSO um, system, IT system. And this connection has to be secure uh, enough to make sure that the whole installation is able to receive message. In that case, um, there is no means for um, uh, SEM outside of uh, embedded in the local CSMS. And then the DSO interface will be able to send what we call curtailment message from the DSO if the local situation of the grid requires it and the DSO can, has the capability to ask for an immediate modification of the power consumed by this system into the grid. Uh, this is, in most countries, something that is mandatory. So the CSO here may receive also a message from other actors, flexibility operator, for example. So this is covered by uh, our architecture as well. And um, again, the load balancing between all those EVSEs is, could be the responsibility of the local CSMS in real time without giving the burden to the cloud CSMS to balance all of those elementary elements. That's the advantage of the edge computing system. So to, to now, to have this architecture in place, we need a requirement and we need the standard and the protocol to operate. And for that, we need a transfer technology to be chosen and attach with the requirement for how this transport technology will work. So I will give some example of the general requirement we already have. And this is part of the dash one document. So we have requirement by domain, energy, mobility, and monitoring. An example for the energy domain is that we cover in conditional charging, smart charging, bi-directional energy transfer. We support V2G, V2X, the grid codes, which that's the way the, the system behavior has to react when the grid has some uh, requirements. And we define the specific role of the DSO as well in, in the requirement we have in the DASH-1 document. We need also to standardize exchange of information between SEM and local CSMS, so we have requirement for that. And of course, 62110 will have to be independent of any type of charging technology, AC, DC, all the flavors of 1511.8 and CHAdeMO and et cetera. So this is what we have today. And uh, just to mention those one, we have many more. Um, we have a requirement for cybersecurity. We are not silent on the requirement of security. Obscurity is not good on cybersecurity. We, so we have a risk assessment analysis that will be published in the DASH-1 document. We have, for example, TLS that is mandatory for all our communication. We support, again, the Dash 2 and Dash 20, 1508 certificates and PKI. And we will have end-to-end -end security between client and server. I will uh, detail that a little bit more later. Of course, we have general requirement for the object modeling. The object model is a very important piece of our standard. And, Basically, the, the, the object model will be U, UML, SIM, and we have connection with use case through a tool that we all use in IEC for that, it's Enterprise Architect. And we have general requirement for the protocol, for the transport, it has to support both IPv6, IPv4, TLS mandatory, that's for cyber messaging. The, the protocol, as we said, with the local CSMS and the cloud has to support a multi-hub architecture, which is giving some constraint of how seamlessly this will work. And most important is that our protocol should support the publish subscribe requirement and request response features. So both of them is something really important for the bandwidth of the protocol. Again, this has to cease, this has to, to make sure that we have something um, 
that has the, uh, the capability to cover millions of charging stations. So the, those pub sub and system are really important. So when it comes to um, encoding technology, we have worked for a year almost, and a year and a half, to define the requirement for the messaging and encoding technology. And we have reached more than 40 requirements for that. And at the end, four candidate technology were pre-selected, XMPP, Co-op, MQTT, and DDS. And finally, recently, and this was a very rigorous selection process, XMPP has been chosen by um, John Working Group 11. So that will be the transport uh, technology that will be used in IC 6110. So what is exactly XMPP? For those who don't know that, um, XMPP is an open communication protocol for message-oriented middleware. Um, it enables very fast, secure, scalable, and almost real-time exchange of XML data between multiple entities. And it is uh, normalized by IETF. It's totally open and no royalty or granted permission are required to use that. And it is extensible. And that means that there is a foundation that cares with developing and publishing uh, extension, what I call XCPs, and through a, a very standardized process for these, defining those extensions. XMPP is, that was one of the argument, is based on XML, so just like ISO 1511 so there is no need for a new encoder in the charging station. That's a less burden for implementers. Uh, XMPP is used for request response publish subscribe system. That was one of our requirements. So it is used in the industry for signaling for VOIP, video, file transfer, gaming, internet of things, and also application for smart grid and social networking services. That's a tremendous uh, use uh, set of requirement that all complies with all the requirement we have been uh, designing for a year and a half. So that's a, a great technology that will owe us a lot of services. And this is because how works XMPP is something that is very interesting for our um, strategy of communication. XMPP is a decentralized client service system. Um, that means that there is a clear separation of role between the client and the server. Every client can connect to every other client using communication that is secured between the servers. So the separation of roles mean that the clients basically in our business is this charging station, the charging station management system and the energy management system can focus on their role. They don't have to focus on transmitting the information. This will be ensured by a set of servers that will care on reliability, scalability, cybersecurity, and inter-server connection. So the communication between the CS and the CSMS is totally transparent and secure. Uh, it is secure because in XMPP, the cybersecurity is in the score specification natively. It has encryption features, secure authentication, and end-to-end -end security between server and clients. And again, this is something the client, the CS, the CSMS, and the SEM will not have to, to, to take care of. This is already built in in the server communication. This decentralized architecture combined with a specific addressing schema that is similar to email. That means if uh, a CS wants to communicate with the CSMS, it just has to know the address of it. And it doesn't have to know where the communication will go, uh, what, how it will be routed. Uh, it is transparent for, um, for client. It is firewall friendly and seamless integration of charging station and SEM will allow the multi-level communication architecture we have designed with the local CSMS and the cloud CSMS. And more, XMPP has a proven scaling capability. It is used, for example, by gaming platform today, securing billions of event and transaction per server per day. So uh, we did not pick this technology for nothing. It has something in built in that ensures us 
a real large capability for the, the next challenge we're expecting with the immobility booming. And furthermore, why we have been choosing also XMPP? Basically because it offers natural integration with smart grid standards. XMPP is one of the bases for DER management standards like 61850-8-2. This standard, which is a running standard that is using XMPP, connects multiple virtual power plants uh, together, ensuring local production and storage distribution. And that could be used directly uh, for uh, connecting different production or storage sheets, uh, sheets um, connected to charging stations. And so this is what I try to, to to, to look here, some utilities may connect to a DER ensuring XMPP connection with one server. An aggregator using another server could connect to a mobility infrastructure as there will be a connection with a federation of server in the middle, the same utility could connect through those server to the same mobility infrastructure and the aggregator using the same protocol could easily connect through this server's connection to the DER using the same transport technology. So that is a great insurance that in the future, all those standards will be able to communicate each other and to be interoperable. One more point is open ADR used by some aggregator in the world also use XMPP as a transport protocol and it has been converted recently into an IEC standard. So that will give more possibility of interoperability for uh, energy actors. So now we have encoding technology, we have message, we have actors, we have um, uh, domains and, uh, and we have a role model. Now comes the time for designing the use cases and the object model. So when it comes to use cases and object model, we have to think of big picture. So first the use cases describe information exchange between system and roles. We have been looking at that before. So you have actors and you have different systems that are connecting through a different sequence. So this is the role of the business use case and the system use case to define what are the information exchange. On the other side, we have the object model that contains packages describing devices, variable and function in the charging stations. Those system need to be connected because this is dealing with information exchange. This is dealing with variable and function that will be influenced by the message. This is the way TC110 will work. All the message will be derived from the connection between the use case and the UML model using the, the tool enterprise architect that is used on both sides. So the message are the way to read and write devices variable and describe message describing the use cases. This will lead to uh, the protocol itself and the dash two document giving security protocol and input for the conformant test and more. All of this will be derived automatically once we have all the use cases and the object model Basically, you just uh, use a, a possibility of enterprise architect to connect both system and to derive all the UML code for all the messages. So this is a development methodology that we are using in uh, 6110. And it's described in a, an IEC standard from the system committee of the IEC here. So when it comes to use case, um, the business use case described in, in, in 6110 are the, the source for the IEC 6110 protocol. They do capture common repeated deployed and envisioned usage for our environment. So this document is divided in three domains, energy, mobility, and charging station management domain. All those domains rely on business use case. They describe situation where so those business actors are doing some objectives, be able to charge for equipment to authorize a charging. The three domain may exchange information, but are relatively independent. 
So let's see what are the business use case already developed in our standard. So again, those three domains. I will not add into too much detail there, but in the energy transfer domain, we have defined a set of use cases for smart charging and discharging, for demand response, that's for flexibility operator, for exchange of information between the energy management system and the CSMS. DSO message like curtailment are defined and a dynamic control mode, which is a specific mode that recently appeared in uh, dash 20 of 15.11.8 is also described here. And much more uh, use cases are coming. In the immobility service domain, we have a use case for information exchange during a service session. I will, uh, will inform you what is a service session here. We have different mode of authorization, remotely, locally, external, mean, uh, credential, um, all mode of authorization are available in, in 6 c 110. We cover also the reservation, the contract tariff information as mm, defined in, in uh, 15 11, 8, and this is attached with the contract certificate that are used in uh, 15 11, 8. This will work with the whole PKI that is defined uh, also in 15 11, 8. And then we have a use case for management of charging station. All of those use cases uh, basically define how to uh, maintain uh, uh, an operative charging station. So the, between the first steps of migration up to the firmware update, uh, the monitoring, the setting some criteria and managing the configuration. There's a whole bunch of use cases that has been developed. More than 30 in total have been developed so far. And transversely to the two first domain, there is the session and transaction domain, and uh, sorry, the service, the session and transaction use case, and the service detail record production, which is very important for ensuring the traceability and, and approval of service uh, of all the energy transfer. So, how this work? Uh, basically, uh, there is a general second diagram that is used for all the use cases, and um, those domains are also split into a uh, life cycle of the charging station. There is installation phase, operation phase, and charging station phase. The installation is just basically commissioning the first one, and it happens only once in the life of the system, and it has uh, quite limited number of use cases attached and message that will be exchanged. Example is certificate, road CA certificate installation uh, in, in the charging session. Once it has been installed, there is a phase of operation with an initial setup, a next a maintenance and diagnostic, and at the end of the life, the decommissioning. The initial setup as well is a very limited number of use cases where you install the firmware, you they install the fault provisioning, install the tariff, and set some criteria for logging or displaying. And the maintenance diagnostic during the life of an operation of a charging station is basically what happens day to day. You have to monitor, you have to diagnostic, you have to manage if there is a change in the configuration, you have to delete information, and this is something very important um, with the GDPR in Europe and in other countries, similar regulations, that uh, we, have, we, we have a very, we attach a very big importance for that to make sure that no private information can be, will be stored or used if the user did not give the, um, the consent. And this is something very hard to get. So we have a lot of uh, use case describing this feature. And then we have the charging session. And this charging session basically, it contains the smart charging event loop. Uh, and that is in the life of the system, uh, one of the most important thing because this is where the user connects to the charging session. And then we have defined a lot of event and queuing and process to make sure that we process those events that may happen at uh, uh, the charging station level when a, a user just plugs or unplug or changes mind and comes before the time of departure was set. There's plenty, dozen, dozen of events that has to be queued and processed. So this is described in our main use case. 
obviously all of those things, the maintenance, diagnostic and parallel event loop will have to be done in parallel in the CSMS for every charging station. And remember, if we have hundreds of thousands of charging sessions, that's hundreds of thousands of parallel sessions running on for each charging station. So we will have a, a precise look on the energy transfer domain um, because we, we, we just need to make sure that uh, we give an example that everyone can understand. So we still have the architecture we, we, we have and uh, for us, uh, this is uh, something that is probably the most important as uh, it is where the user connects to the standard. And it's a native feature of our standard that describes real-time adaptation to events. So let me give you a quick flavor of how it works. In the life of the CSMS, most of the time is spent on optimizing the charging session. So uh, we want to minimize the communication between the CS and the CSMS. So this is why we use extensively the PAPSA mechanism provided by XMPP. With that mechanism, all the actors can send an exchange message without necessity of heartbeat signal and pooling. This will reduce dramatically the need of real-time communication bandwidth. And this was one of our constraints. So this is an example of the main diagram, state diagram loop for the charging session, ensuring the smart charging. I will not enter into detail of this, but I will just say that this state diagram ensure that we have real-time schedule update, schedule for charging. Update based on the variation on power condition in the building, either plus or minus consumption or production. This will also ensure the dynamic load balancing between all the EVSEs based on power constraint that could vary on, based on SEM signals. It will get incentive from the energy market. It will be able to respond to ancillary services requests from secondary flexibility operators. And it will be, and in the same time, you will have to ensure that we have traceability and proof of service. And this is something absolutely important and very, very tricky. If in a group of EVSEs, you have one that is injecting power and all the others are just charging, probably depending on the structure of the grid line, but it is very likely that all the charging EVs will seek the power from the discharging EV. So how the way this is measured is something tricky to ensure that the service for the flexibility operator has been measured correctly and granted. So this is something we try to ensure with our standard. And this proof of service is ensured via a specific session and transaction mechanism that we have been defining in our standard. So I will quickly go in that description because that's kind of a very complex thing. So what are the session and transaction? Basically, we will have to cover charging and discharging. And at the end, the user expects to have a final invoice, what we call the SDR for service detail record. And that final invoice, we have to cover all the billable item of the session. And this is exactly the reason why we define session and transaction. And this is quite new, it's not used by other um, open standard already deployed. Uh, when we talk about session and transaction, we are not talking about communication session, but we're talking about a special session reflecting the activity between the instant when an EV enter into the 60C110 scope and when they leave it. So they are mainly used for identification and track all the billable service triggered during the charging session. So let me give a more example. The service session are um, subdivided in five subsession, authorization, energy transfer session, parking session, reservation session, and other type of session. This is encapsulate in a service session. And every time in a vertical session, could be an authorization or a parking event, every time something happens, it is recorded by the standard on a transaction. And at the end, we will have 
a smatches transaction, we will have event for the authorization for the energy transfer could be, for example, the start of the energy transfer. That will be one transaction. If somehow during the charging session, there is a frequency control regulation service that is triggered by a flexibility operator or by some secondary actors, then there will be a transaction that will be recorded precisely and time stamped. So all those sub session parameters will be recorded in time. And at the end of the service session, all those elements will be grouped and managed by uh, the CSO to form the service detail record to get the final invoice. A quick example of how this works. The service session, for example, starts on June 10th at nine when the EV is first parked. So this will trigger a parking session and a parking transaction when the EV is first parked. Then uh, some moment later, the user will plug and get an authorization. This will trigger an authorization session and an authorization transaction. A few minutes later, when the energy transfer starts, this will trigger an energy transfer transaction. And at the end, there will be a parking transaction because the user leaves the parking and plug the car. This will end the energy transfer session and this will end the authorization session. In that particular case, all the sub session will end in the same time. Mm. Be aware that the CSMS will have to maintain multiple parallel hundreds or thousands of parallel service session corresponding to each EV engaged in a service session. So that was a simple one. If we go to a more complex one, I will not detail, but you could see that there is reservation session, parking session, authorization, energy transfer session, and other session. Other session could be the use of a valet, for example, that will take care of the car during all the charging session. And note that the reservation session here starts on June 1st, but the car arrives at the charging station only on June 10th. So there might be a lot of days before the service session start because that will be in the scope of our standard to receive the element to check when the car arrives if the reservation is valid and if the car has been properly identified. So this is why the transaction here starts when the service session starts at the reservation that could be made on internet which is totally out of our scope. So this is how the, the, the service session is used because it will give a lot of information uh, to ensure the proof of service and traceability of all the operation. And that will be in the heart of a uh, 62110 uh, standard document. So when it comes to relation to other standards, um, that is also something interesting. Uh, we have relation with other IEC and ISO standards. Uh, obviously, we, we support all type of charging technology and we do that by delegating to the EVSC, the local management from electrotechnical point of view to the charging station. So we will be able to support chargers with only 61851 technology. We will support all the uh, 1511 a standard the dash 2 and the dash 20 we will ob obviously be able to transfer the certificate and to connect to the pki um, something that is interesting in uh, in iso 1511 dash 20 uh, some information are including in some optional parameter display parameter like the SARC, the range and the battery capacity for the OEM transferring this information, we will make sure that those information are transferred to secondary actors just so they can be able to operate services. And of course, other technologies that Chalimo will be also supported. Uh, we have close relationship with WG9, which is the roaming protocol. Uh, many members are common to those two groups and our objective is to coordinate the definition and agreed upon boundary actors, uh, use cases and information exchange. For sure, in order uh, the mobility environment to work and to allow any type of user to connect to any charging station, the roaming protocol is one of the most important thing and we have to transfer all the user information up to this, um, uh, up to the actors willing uh, to work with 6C119. We have 
obviously other common objective with TC57 because it's a joint working group with them. And basically we're working with them to ensure that our standard complies to the distributed energy resource standard and particularly with the 61850-7-420, which is the standard uh, designing the DR object model. Method from flexibility operator from DSO to CSMS are done via IEC 61850, and they are captured in process by IEC 62 maintaining all of our use cases. And especially for flexibility operator, the security and the proof of service mechanism included in our standard are the basis for these services. The security is something I did not much insist on, but uh, it is really important when we will have millions of EVSCs connected to EV that no one could uh, send a malicious message triggering either on and off or the other way around all those EVSCs in the same time this would probably collapse an entire grid at the European level if those would be done at millions of EVS in the same time. So we have to make sure that the security is in place when it comes to flexibility operator giving orders to shed to some of the EVSs. That is one of our main targets to ensure the security of the connection. We also have relation with the existing management solutions as you know, there are many existing specifications for station, station management. Some are open, like a CPP. Other are industry proprietary development. And we have to say that most of them are not able to interoperate. Basically, for technical reason, the transport technology and object model are usually very different. Uh, so how we can deal with that? Our mission is to develop a new international open standard, ensuring interoperability uh, for all uh, future e-mobility technology. And this will be based on experience and contribution of experts from all the world. And they are already working on that very hard today. So the interoperability with existing deployed system is, is then not a reasonable option. So 6 c 110 will not be interoperable with existing system already deployed. Among the existing specification, OCPP claims to be one of the most used, and um, industry uh, is using a lot of different version of OCPP, and uh, a lot of our member in the in our group are also member of uh, OCA or are using uh, OCPP. Uh, so this is why we have accepted to have an official liaison with OCA and with objective to share document and comment from uh, their respective experts. Uh, as I said, many experts belonging to both uh, and they bring their experience and uh, on protocol and immobile issue, e issue to solve. And we are very happy with that. I would add that from a strict hardware point of view, uh, we do all we can and it is expected that the charging station and the CSMS supporting a CPP 2.x will be able to support IEC 62110 stack. That means that it will be only a matter of firmware update to migrate from uh, an OCPP CS to a 62110 CS. Okay, my conclusion. Uh, IC62110 is an international IEC standard for charging station management, clearly. Based, it is based on consensus within 21 nations, and for us, it prefigures the future of e-mobility management interoperability in a scalable and secure way. And furthermore, it ensures the great integration and hopefully the best EV user experience. Join the team, please, and bring your own expertise. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much for this uh, in-depth presentation on IEC 63110. So how would people be able to join then? Sorry? So how would people, you, you uh, concluded with join us, uh, how would industries or people be able to join? Oh, oh, that's easy. That's an IEC group. So uh, the people should uh, connect to their um, national committee uh, for standardization and uh, just um, 
be member of their national committee and then they will ask to be member of uh, uh, joint working group 11 that's very usual way to uh, to to be a member of iec group you just have to connect to your um, national committee for standardization in france it's nor in germany's vde in a uh, in many other country uh, they all the country have their own um, national committee for standardization you just have to be a member of this national committee and be nominated as experts okay thank you uh, throughout the presentation i was and i'm sure uh, many people thinking well how does that link to ocpp or how is that different to ocpp and you ended nicely with mm -hmm. mentioning the ocpp and it is excellent to hear that uh, the companies who chose uh, not to develop their own proprietary protocol, but to use an open protocol such as OCPP, if they're using OCPP 2.x, uh, will be able to upgrade to IEC 63110. Is that correct? Uh, yes, provided the, the hardware is compatible, and that's the main point. Uh, and we try to, to, be, to make sure that uh, uh, this will be possible. Basically, the hardware it needs some power computing, but this is not something very, very complex. We know that OCPP has already uh, designed some local um, CSMS. So basically, it's a kind of the, the, the model will be different. But for me, the, the hardware would be the same. And this is just a matter of upgrading the software. Uh, How do we ensure that the hardware is compatible? No, 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 no. Uh, they, we, we cannot make sure, but uh, in terms of power crunching and memory and everything, probably a, a system able to run OCPP.2.x will be able to run 6110 because we don't need, um, we probably don't need more um, okay. memory. Um, and so this is by yeah. the fact that uh, we, we use. Um, a client to server. Most of the uh, transmission protocol will be embedded in the server and all the burden of transmission, cybersecurity, everything is embedded in the server and not in the client. Uh, okay. The server is basically cloud-based or and it's different. So basically the charging station uh, able to uh, run OCPP 2.x will probably have the enough hardware to run um, IEC 6110. Okay, so uh, assuming here that uh, a charging point uh, operator uh, uh, want to migrate to IEC 63110, they will have to upgrade their firmware. Oh yes, for sure, because the, the software uh, will be totally incompatible. We don't have the same object model. Well, we... Why, uh, Paul, I, I'm here playing the devil's advocate. Why would they want to do that? Oh, why? Sorry. Oh, uh, that's the problem of uh, uh, IEC. Not the problem. That's the way IEC works. We define a standard with 21 uh, nations with a, a lot of uh, industry are represented. All the industry that are now building this IEC standard will choose to use IEC um, 63110 standard. Okay. Okay, so, so, so would it, uh, my understanding is right now, OCPP is the de facto standard for charging point operators, and then IEC 63110 will become the de jure standard. Uh, that's, that's what normally IEC does. IEC provides standard that okay. is used by industry, that is used for tenders by municipality, that is used because it is referred in all the tenders that the countries are providing so that is got it. How it goes, yeah got it got it and when do you think you you did put uh, the timeline earlier when do you think the earliest that the charging point uh, manufacturer can implement iec 63110 yeah so um, basically if we look at um, the timeline um, when the well, we have a document that is called fdis fdis is the, is the it's an international draft. Uh, it is very close to the publicated draft, and this could be in the middle of 2022. Okay, so earliest is middle of 2022. That yeah, at least two years and a half. That's the okay. earliest. Yes. Okay, okay. 
and again with uh, if we take into if we, we look at an uh, uh, zoom out view of the e-mobility it's only existed uh, for 10 years so maybe another two and a half years is, is okay yeah and if we project in 2040 as i try to do uh, when there will be millions and millions of ebscs everywhere uh, so uh, this is what the industry means needs to have in the target how to ensure that all the ecosystem will be able to manage those hundreds of millions of transactions every day. So uh, uh, there will be different version of uh, 6110 for sure. The first version is in two, two years and a half. And for sure there will be version two in maybe five or six years. And this is the way IEC works and ISO as well. We are now in, a, a, we have two standards for uh, 15, 11, 8, and there might be addition to of different of those version in the coming months and years. So this is the way uh, industry try to adapt to, let's say, the, the trends of the market. Because uh, if IEC standard do not reflect the market, uh, then it, it will not be used. So this is why we, we have a lot of industry gathered into this group we have many members from many countries and this gives us confidence that it will be used as soon as it is published and it will be maintained uh, with different um, additions and evolution to make sure that it follows what the market uh, is where the market is going by the way <laughs> because that's a, still a moving target in mobility world you know nobody really knows what will be the uh, the business model in 10 years Really, really, that's a very critical question. And it, it is related to the flexibility we can have in our model and in our uh, description of the protocol. Because if we cannot have enough flexibility for that protocol in the coming years, then we probably will not be able to adapt to the direction where the market goes. And as nobody knows today where we will be in 10 or 20 years, in terms of technology, in terms of services, in terms of acceptance, uh, then we have to be the more possible flexible we can. Okay, thank you, thank you, Paul. Um, moving on to some of the questions on the from the participants, we've covered uh, the related OCPP versus IEC six three one one zero. Would you mind taking a look at the question from uh, Roberto Meteri on uh, the choice of XMPP? Oh, uh, Roberto Meteri, yeah. Are you able to to, to check to check the charts, right? I, I, yeah, I'm in the chat. I can read yes, that. Yeah. Some other are have other chosen or migrated to MQTT as it is more lightweight a protocol and offers similar security, as they say. Have you taken MQTT in consideration? If yes, have you been what have been the aspect differences that has been driven your choice? Uh, yes, MQTT has been considered. We have considered actually four technology. MQTT, XMPP, CoAP, and DDS. And um, there has been a vote between all the members and a, a very, very, a, a very serious, um, let's say, requirement analysis against those protocols. And at the end, there were um, two technologies that were selected, MQTT and XMPP. And XMPP got more than 65% of the votes. So at the end, we selected XMPP. One of the main reasons is that XMPP is also used by uh, the energy industry. And it has a track record for being able to connect and to, um, to ensure billions of transactions every day. Uh, MQTT is, could probably say the same thing. Uh, but it's not using the energy world. So that probably made a difference. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from uh, Hans Peter, if you can take it, if you don't mind reading it. So uh, we. Uh, yeah. Okay. DSO interface, which is not standardized, but some country like Germany and France have regulation in place and leave it to DNO to define the technical solution. Do you have insight how measured DSO entities in France is planning to realize it? Any hint what interface need to be prepared for France? 
Or do you have any contact information who we could contact to clarify the French implementation? Uh, yes, I have contact, <laughs> of course. Uh, and uh, maybe if Hans Peter send me an email after that, uh, my email is in the presentation, but uh, maybe Miriam, you could connect to him. So I, I could be the, the DSO uh, any of these contacts if he wants. Um, uh, if, if, Hans, if Hans wants to connect with you directly, please feel free to do so, Hans. Yeah. Uh, yes, the DSO interface is not standardized. Uh, it, in the same way in all countries. And this is true that uh, in France and Germany, we have regulation in place. And uh, basically for, for, for France, we use 61850. Uh, and in Germany, I, I cannot speak for Germany. I, I have no, no, not enough information for that. But uh, we have a clear parallel way in France and Germany to how the regulation for DSO interface works. Uh, basically, they are all ensuring the cyber security and the connection to, in order to be able to give what, what we call curtailment message. That means that a limitation in the power. Uh, and uh, there is a clear view in most of the European countries to make sure that when it comes to distributed energy resources, uh, the, the distribution company may have a way to be able to send secure, and again, the word secure is very important here, message to every DER to make sure that they do not disturb the grid or that they could participate to the grid respecting what we call the grid codes. So yeah, there is kind of a unification of those in Europe, but certainly not in the world. And uh, Europe is one of the most advanced places in the world where we, when we have a CINELEC standard for that, that is normally um, should be put in place very soon. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from Achim. If you, is there a support from the German, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Is there a support for the German Eirecht? Uh, sorry, what is Eirecht? If Achim is still with us, I'm going to unmute him. Uh, uh, Ach yeah, you can, yeah. German calibration law. So when the German uh, Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt requires us to sign the measurements of the uh, ah, energy yeah. okay. meter. Okay, 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 I understand. You, okay, in Germany there is a need for having a specific device ensuring the security of the transaction to make sure that no other than basically the user or the people who the user giving rights can read that information or temper it. So we don't have such device in, um, in France uh, or in other very specific for Germany. Uh, for the moment, uh, we do not have requirement for supporting this device. But as you know, the, uh, the co the co convener for 6110 is uh, Stefan Boyd from Energy. So and is perfectly aware of this uh, specificity of the German market. So. Uh, <coughs> he, he, he will make sure that we do not um, prevent uh, this German regulation to be in place. Of course, we cannot write specific for each country specific requirement, but we should ensure that we do not prevent local regulation to be enforced. That is the way the IC works. Okay. Okay. Anything you'd like to add on that, Paul? No, no, no. Okay, there is a question. Uh, uh, have you put in the slides the different acronyms of the timeline? Um, ah, no, no, oh, sorry. <laughs> would, you mind, uh, would you mind in the slides that you will share adding them? Yeah, I will. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, are there actors working on standards for interoperability between flexibility operator system and central uh, 
the uh, CSMS. SMS and yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, some groups are trying to work now with this, uh, specifically in Italy. Uh, some um, Italian actors uh, are now thinking to uh, start a new standard for that. And um, of course, uh, we have strong relation with those actors because they also are a member of 60C110 group. And uh, of course, if, there, if this group is, um, is starting a new uh, standard, we will have to have a clearly a liaison and uh, uh, maybe more uh, advanced communication, just like we have with the roaming protocol to make sure that all the mesh flowing down from the flexibility actor to the CSMS will be able to be um, transported down to the CS to be active. Yeah, uh, there is a tentative for that. And uh, the, the, let's say that the timeline for that would be probably this year. It would be started this year, yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Paul, do you have another five minutes? Of course, I have plenty of time. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, you mentioned the cybersecurity task. Um, uh, who is involved in this? Uh, how can we find more information on this? Oh, the, um, the task force is led by um, an expert, which is a member of uh, Joint Working Group 11. And uh, he owns his company in cybersecurity, and uh, he provided us with uh, many requirements. And within this task force, there is also a Korean professor that is a professor in the University of Seoul. And he is also providing a lot of requirement. And he's a specialist on 1508. He's also a member for 1508. He's a member of um, 60C119 as well. So he is a very active and great guy that provides a lot of inputs. So we have a couple of good guys. And of course, every time we have requirements or use case on cybersecurity, all experts are encouraged to give those use case and element to their own company's experts to make sure that the whole cybersecurity framework that will be in place in Grand Working Group 11 will be solid and uh, with no, let's say, no backdoors possible or no, <laughs> nothing that could prevent to use it. And are there documentations already available on these requirements? Uh, not available yet, but they will be in the CDD. Yes, the whole risk analysis in the, is in the CDD document. Okay. So that will be available for, okay, national committees through the standards organization, but uh, not to everyone. But uh, when the document is published, uh, then that will be available for anyone who will uh, get access to the document. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, we talked about um, uh, IEC 63110 to connect to the customer energy manager. Is that correct? Sorry, can you repeat? We talked about IEC 63110 uh, to connect between an electric vehicle charge point and the customer energy manager. Oh, yes. Yes. That's okay. a very important. Yes. So the customer energy manager would also need to connect and control uh, other uh, energy smart appliances. And these energy smart appliances would be using different protocols. So do we see in the future a scenario where the customer energy management manager will have to implement several protocols? Uh, yes, unfortunately, yes. Uh, and I suppose as long as we have the minimum required hardware, then it's a question of implementing uh, different software on that hardware? Is that too simplistic? Uh, no, it's not that simplistic. The problem is that uh, there is a lot of discussion with the SEM. And you, you, keep, you, you still see my screen, I believe, no? Yes. Yes, yes. I so the, the SEM here is in, in, in the middle of everything. It, it connects to secondary reactors. It's connect to the other load and production and storage that are in the building and it connects to the mobility infrastructure through the local CSMS. So this actor is very central actor in the building. And the problem is that there is no standard today. They are 
all of those systems are very proprietary today. Most of them are not open. So um, we decided that we could not uh, let this uncertainty open. So we had to close it. And what we, de what we decided is to, to have this interface at the same level and the same that would be able to connect to us need to have this interface. Hopefully there is a Senelec, the European standard describing SEM with an uh, interface to um, industrial segment. So they, they define interface to production, they define interface to load, they define interface to storage, and they, they are defining interface to mobility, but this is an empty shell. So what we expect is that they will fill this empty shell with our specification and requirements. And then once we have done that, uh, the, the SAM uh, protocol uh, will be connected to a 6 c 110 protocol. Uh, we have a meeting next in, in two weeks, in three weeks now in Netherlands, and um, the people from the same community in Europe will be invited to share with us, and hopefully we will be able to connect those two worlds. Thank you. Last question. Uh, do you see a future where the charging uh, of an electric vehicle is done directly via an OEM route instead of going through the charging infrastructure? Ah, you, you mean by telematics, for example? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, that is o o already existing. Uh, and the point is that um, that's technically possible. I'm not sure if you look at this diagram, for example, if the EVSE here subjects to requirement coming from directly from another actor and not coming through the whole chain here, uh, then how the SEM and the local CSMS can do load balancing with this particular EV. There is no way to include this EV into the whole general energy balance of the building because it will basically have its own life dependent of all the other actors. And the energy balance in the building is basically how to balance all this energy between all the actors in the smoothest way possible. Mm -hmm. And if you have one actor here that doesn't play the game, then it will just be ignored by the others because there is no way to send and to exchange messages with it. So there is a risk that if some of those actors just directly send flexibility message to the EVSE, for example, the SEM mm -hmm. discovering that, oh, there is more energy available because some of the EVSEs got flexibility message, then the SAM will just, oh, allocate more energy, for example, to other cars. And then the benefit for the grid will be just canceled. So at the end, if there is no benefit for the grid and no benefit for secondary reactors, how, where and how the user would accept to have flexibility if it doesn't have final benefit for it. So this is something uh, bothers me and we have a lot of discussion on that. Uh, the right way to have the balance of the energy in a building is to make sure that the SEM see the entirely nodes of all the point of production, storage and consumption. And this goes through this architecture of communication. Thank you. I actually received an interesting question while you were speaking. We talked about uh, um, IEC 63110 linking the EV charger and uh, the CEM. Uh, what about EE bus? We've seen trials where EE bus is playing that function. Uh, is there a link with the EE bus development initiative, or this is an uncoordinated, or is this happening independently? No, for, for the moment, uh, EE bus is acting independently. Uh, basically, um, EE bus is designing, uh, as, as far as I know, a higher level protocol. Uh, but I'm not sure, but it doesn't specify the transport layer or the file level layer for this protocol. So I'm not sure this is totally incompatible. 
Okay. Uh, uh, probably this could be a possibility to connect those two worlds. And uh, this has already been not done, but uh, discussed in, in 1511-8, where some of the experts then brought their experience on eBus. And we have some message that in, in, um, in 1511-8 that are using this one of the specificity of eBus. So uh, I, I see no opposition for that. Uh, I believe that if there is eBus expert they, they should show up in our in one of our meeting and explain what are the advantage the pros and cons and we are totally open to any type of initiative that would um uh, let's say give more feature to to our standards okay. paul thank you so much for this that was really helpful and i'd like also to thank the participants um, for the questions and participation I hope it was not too much complex, but uh, the, the, the subject is quite complex and uh, I have many, many more details to, to present, but um, okay. Maybe in, uh, maybe in part two. <laughs> <laughs> many thanks, Miriam, for uh, allowing me to present this and to try to evangelize as much as possible experts in the community. Thank you very much. Of course. Much. Thank you so much, Paul. Bye. Bye.